So Amanda, how have you been? How is life for you these days? Oh man, um, I'm a young mom, so I, you can imagine not a lot of sleep, a lot of cuddles, and I'm feeling really fortunate because you know back when I was on trial and in prison and everything, that was one of the hardest things to wrap my mind around was the idea that I might not ever get to be a mom. Mm -hmm. So I'm feeling really lucky and fortunate. Yeah, you're very much a mom now of two <laughs> little ones. You have a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a husband. Yes, Talk who are out on the roof playing right now. <laughs> on the CTO roof playing. Talk about, yeah, that new chapter of your life and really leaning into family. Yep, leaning into family, um, also working a lot. My husband and I have our podcast, Labyrinths, where we do a lot of advocacy work and also interviewing people about times that they felt really lost because um, I feel like that's something that is resonates with anyone. I think one of the big issues in wrongful convictions is people think, oh my God, like it's so extreme. I can't relate to it. I can't tell you the number of times people have said to me like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I can't even imagine. And while I get that sentiment and it's, it's meant well, I want to say, well, Actually, I think you probably can imagine it because everyone has a worst day when something really overwhelming that was out of their control just came in and took over their life and now they have to adapt. And that is the wrongful conviction experience except it's the state that does that to you and you don't know how long it's going to take to, or if it will at all resolve, mm -hmm. so. And we'll get into that, but before we lose sight of, yeah. of your day to day, <laughs> I am curious, people are curious about your day to day, <laughs> where you live, what you do outside of work and family. I mean, you have a normal life, would you say? Hmm, um, I don't know what a normal life is anymore. Um, I kind of, stepped away from trying to aspire to have a normal life after I became a public figure. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, I'm living on my little island in the Pacific Northwest. I have friends, we go to the grocery store. Uh, you know, my daughter goes to a forced preschool. So like the day-to-day -day rhythms are very much, honestly, just focused on my kids and getting them through the day and getting the work done that I need to do during the day. So it's really, I think maybe I, I, I do somehow have a normal life all of a sudden. <laughs> but then at the same time, like you said, you are a public figure. And I wanted to ask you about that. You know, you have in-laws now, new neighbors that you'll meet or parents of your kids' friends. Yeah. And all of those people probably know something about you or have a preconceived idea of who you are or at least some details they've heard along the way. What is it like living that way? It is... I have had to adapt to the fact that the worst experience of my life is probably the first thing people ever know about me. And... Um, and the difficulty of that doesn't go away. Um, it is a little bittersweet though, because again, we all have our worst experiences and typically we get to choose when and with whom we get to share them. And that is an immense privilege. On the other hand though, the worst experiences of our lives can distance our, um, us from other people. And weirdly, because the worst experience of my life left me so exposed, I find that I can cross distances really quickly with people because it's just all there. It's, it's there. And we can talk about it, we can not talk about it. Um, I, I've grown to feel more comfortable talking about it because I feel like with time, it's been 17 years since I was arrested, I've wrapped my mind not just around what happened, but what it means and what it means for me personally, what it means for the broader society. And so I feel more comfortable talking about it. Whereas when I first came home, I was living in this idea during prison that I would get to go back to the life that I was living before Italy. And I was very quickly disabused of this idea that I could go back to being an anonymous creative writing student. Um, and instead I was the girl accused of murder. Um, and I was very lonely for a really long time because it made me feel like there was this huge distance between me and the rest of humanity. And 
what changed that was actually going to my first ever Innocence Network event mm. where I met other wrongly convicted people and I finally grasped like, oh my God, this isn't just a personal tragedy for me, it is a societal tragedy for so many people. And the ripple effects of these tragedies are far reaching, far more than we really acknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about the work happening locally and the reason you're here tonight. Um, you do public speaking engagements. I know tonight your keynote theme is, is about resilience mm -hmm. and you've had to have that, uh, obviously throughout the situations you've been in, but especially lately with mm -hmm. the reconviction, the slander. Um, case and I wonder how that felt to when you've moved on from something and distanced yourself from it and you're living in Washington with your husband and kids to get pulled back into this chapter of your life how have you dealt with that I think that what I would say is I'm never far from this tragedy and this experience um, again because it was so public so it became so prominent in my life I couldn't go around like I couldn't interact with the world without the world having that sort of lens through which to view me and interact with me. So I've always had that since I came home. And I think instead what I've learned is that instead of feeling like I have to run away from the worst experience of my life, I can look at it directly in the face. And first of all, it becomes a little less scary when you finally look at something directly in the face, but also you find ways of turning it around and making it feel like it's not a burden, but an opportunity. And this is something I talk about a lot when it comes to resilience. Um, I recently did a, a whole series of like meditations for the Waking Up app actually about this topic in relation to my own experience where we can either run away from what is happening to us emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, because it's scary and we don't know what to do and we're overwhelmed and we are powerless in many ways. And that's a choice, but I think it's ultimately a disempowering choice because you're basically grieving the life that you should have been living instead of living the life you are living. And so what I'm looking at every day when I wake up, and I've been doing this ever since prison, is waking up and asking myself, what is the best thing that I can do today with what it is? It's not crying about what it should be. It's looking it in the face, acknowledging what it is and saying what is the best thing that I can do and that's something that I feel really proud of because I can't change the world every day but I can do something something humble that matters to somebody else and you know in prison it might have been writing a letter to my mom today it's showing up for the Great North Innocence Project telling my story and hopefully getting people inspired to support their work mm -hmm. and so you feel like yeah you have learned that lesson and you've sort of evolved past living in the past that yeah. you're, you've been able to move on. I've evolved past living as if the past is this burden or this scary thing that I need to run away from. It just is what it is. Okay, let's talk about your work. So best-selling author, you're a speaker, <laughs> you consider yourself an advocate, and the podcast too. How did you land on the name Labyrinths? Uh, well, my husband and I are both huge fans of Borges. Um, so his short story collection, but also the idea of being lost in this big space that you don't know how to get out of. Like, how do you find your way again? Do you get out? Do you ever get out? Are you just walking into a new labyrinth every day with blind corners and minotaurs chasing you? Like that idea that we all are running away from something it was really interesting to me and I wanted to embrace that idea. And then of course, because of who I am and because of the work that I do and the advocacy that I do, we end up talking a lot about the criminal justice system. I did a whole big series called Blood Money about the ethics of true crime journalism. Uh, right now we're working on a whole series about false confessions. And we're also asking like really interesting questions that I don't hear a lot, even in the wrongful conviction community um, about when so there are a lot of reasons why people get wrongly convicted, right? And you can, you know, people can look these up. You know, there's bad forensics, there's incentivized witness testimony, there's false confessions when people are coerced by police into implicating themselves. One thing that I'm really interested in is the question of how these interview techniques that police employ to get people to self-incriminate might also be employed to get 
witnesses to incriminate others. And I think that taking a really, really hard, honest look about what happens behind closed doors in a police station or even out in the open, but between police officers and civilians is going to crack the nut in a lot of ways of this like disquiet we feel about the criminal justice system. Yeah, since being wrongfully convicted yourself, and that was obviously in a different country, now you've come back to learn more about what happens in this country. Oh yes. What have you learned about wrongful convictions in America? Well, first of all, they typically do not resolve themselves in four or eight years like mine did. Um, typically the a person who is wrongly convicted here in the United States spends at least 14 years in prison, if not more. Um, typically, they do not look like someone like me. Anyone can be wrongly convicted, anyone can be wrongly accused, but typically you're going to see men and men of minorities, um, men who have mental illness. These are people who are being targeted and who find themselves in positions of not being able to defend themselves properly. Um, that's where you see an inadequate defense counsel. That's where you see incentivized eyewitness testimony. So it's really troubling how people like me who grew up in the suburbs with a middle class family, I never thought that I had to think about the criminal justice system. It was not something that was on my radar at all. And then suddenly it came crashing down on me. And I, the first time I went to an innocence event, I walked into a room full of hundreds of people who are mostly men of color who had been through the exact same experience as me. And I had no idea that this, this family that, that I belonged to even existed. And so one of the things that I think about today is what is my role in that community? How can I be a bridge between that community and the kinds of communities that I grew up in that never had to think about this? How can you be that bridge? Well, one is by telling my story so that people understand how it happens, how easily it can happen, how things, how this like slippery slide of like public pressure and 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 moral um, outrage can lead to the complete dehumanization of a person who's been accused of the crime, even if there's a complete lack of evidence. And then talking about what are these causes, what are the incentives, what is happening in the police office, how are people being trained, how are they not being trained, and then. The, Again, also the, the, the consequence is not just to the person who finds themselves at ground zero, but to the families and to the communities that have suffered these, these injustices again and again and again, and how that leads to relationships between citizens and the institutions that are supposed to be there to support and protect us that are frayed and broken. Mm -hmm. Um, just at the event you're going to tonight, like you'll see Marvin Haynes, who was recently exonerated here in Minnesota. We just had another case this week where our new conviction review unit suggested um, that another person in prison is Amazing. innocent. And so we've had a lot of movement in this space in Minnesota. Do you feel like in general when you meet people that they have faith in our criminal justice system? Or do you think that that narrative is changing a bit? Depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> um, I think what's happening today is we have more access. It, there's a little bit more transparency. Just even with the digital age, we, we are having the ability to see things that are happening that we weren't able to see before. And I think that's leading people to ask questions. And that's one of the reasons why true crime journalism and, and even entertainment is not necessarily a bad thing. It's shedding light on what is happening already that some of us have just not had access to. And because there, we want to proclaim a common humanity, we want to relate to people who have been hurt and who have been victims of the criminal justice system just as much as we want to support people who have been victims of crime. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you as an exoneree yourself, when that moment of relief came for you, what did that feel like? Oh, um, I mean, the moment I was exonerated or the moment I met another wrongly convicted person? The moment you were exonerated. Oh my God. Well, the moment I was exonerated, I, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that as a possibility. So um, if you follow the whole long saga of my trials, I was going up against a Supreme Court with a, with a conviction against me. I was facing 28 and a half years in prison. And my, my hope was that the Supreme Court would overturn that conviction and grant me a new trial. 
So the fact that the Supreme Court in Italy not only overturned the conviction, but definitively acquitted me per non aver commesso il fatto for not having committed this crime was, I was shocked. I was, I was not prepared for that outcome. It's a very rare outcome in Italy. It's not, it's, it's available, but no one ever expects that kind of strong definitive verdict. And so, I mean, I just immediately called Raffaele, um, who was on trial alongside me, and I just jumped up and down and was like, we're free. Like the, the feeling of no longer being hunted down was, I, I felt I was on the moon. I was just jumping. <laughs> and then the second part of the question, like meeting someone else who had been through that, I think, I don't know, does that, does that provide comfort? Is there a bond? It, there's an immediate bond. Um, it's interesting because we're, we're from all different walks of life, from all over the United States and all around the world at this point. I've met exonerees from all around the world. And there's an immediate understanding of, I, know, I see you and I know, and you don't have to explain a thing to me. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of exonerees carry with us is this feeling that we have to explain ourselves for the rest of our lives to other people. And in this one room of people who have had the same experience, we just don't have to explain a thing. And the relief that comes with that. So I feel like I'm just trying to make that room bigger and include more people who have not had that experience to, to understand that maybe if I explain my story enough, someone else next won't have to explain themselves quite as much to the world. It's been 17 years since your arrest. What helped you move past it ultimately, do you think? I mean, first of all, my family, who was with me throughout the entire process and um, and and had had their own prison experience really um long lasting consequences of having to drop everything in your life just to save your daughter um and now that i'm a mom myself i can appreciate how my mom's experience was far worse than mine that she had to go into a prison and walk away and leave me there every single time so my family um, meditation has been a huge part of it. Um, I, um, I'm an avid and firm believer in just like sitting quietly with your mind, not judging yourself for the feelings that arise and letting go. Um, that's been extremely helpful. Um, so I think those are the top things. And then of course, meeting other wrongly convicted people and feeling like I can do something positive with this experience and having being given the opportunity by the Great North Innocence Project to be here so that what happened to me matters. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard you talk about this, that you're obviously you're very proud of who you are. You haven't tried to distance yourself <laughs> from, you know, your name or you've really, I guess, not leaned into it, but you haven't shied away from your past. And I'm sure that there were moments where you're tempted to just quietly fade into the background, because that was a choice I'm sure you had. But instead you've leaned in and leaned into this advocacy work. Why do that? Well, it goes back to that question of like, when I wake up today and I look at everything that I have, everything that's been given to me, whether I ask for it or not, I ask myself, what is the best thing that I can do with this? And I believe that leaning into being Amanda Knox is ultimately doing good for the world in a way that hiding and changing my name and pretending to be someone else that this didn't happen to wouldn't. Um, let's see. You're, you're on the other side of the microphone now. You know, you <laughs> consider yourself a journalist, I believe that, that would be accurate to say. And so you're a journalist yourself. You're the one asking the questions, leading the conversation. What was it like switching to be on the other side. So gratifying <laughs> um, because I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to media. And I know now what it feels like to be asked <laughs> questions about the worst experience of your life. And I know what questions absolutely should be asked and what questions don't need to be asked. I know how to relate to people when they're 
when they're evoking those memories and those feelings. And I think that makes me for, um, I'm often told when, I, when I'm interviewing someone, one, oh my God, no one's ever asked me that question. Huh. <laughs> That's a compliment, right? When you right? get that as it's a like, reporter. Yeah, I do my homework. Yeah. And two, um, a lot of people say I've never felt more heard. And that's, again, so gratifying to me because our stories are precious to us. They are who we are. And when our stories are stolen from us and are exploited for scandal, for money, for politics, for whatever it may be, a part of us is, is taken away. It's who we are. And so being able to use my platform to give people the opportunity to take their voice back means so much to me and it also means being willing to make difficult decisions like i've interviewed people i was developing a series once where i was working for two years on a whole series and at the end of it i asked the person okay now that it's over do you feel comfortable with it going out and they said no and i said okay and that that was that. that. I'm not in the business of being like, you better tell your story to me or else, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what um, I've seen a lot of, especially wrongly convicted people or even victims of crime being put in positions where people say, well, we're going to tell your story for you. So you better just go along with it and trust us. And it's like, no, 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 no. Something that is really important to me is that the people who are most deeply impacted, who have the biggest consequences for their story being told, have a say in how their story is told and whether it is told. And that is not something that you see in the industry right now. Any other causes that you advocate for that you'd like to take time to tell people about? Oh, sure, yeah. So um, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice is a really incredible organization that um, I do you know, advisory council work for. So they support um, opportunities for people who are not in prison to visit and communicate with people who are in prison. Just so that, again, these behind closed doors environments that most of us don't have access to become demystified. There's some transparency there's some common humanity that is that is reached just from sitting next to a person and talking openly with them even if they have committed a crime say and one of the things that I like to advocate for is a reimagining of what is the purpose of our criminal justice system is it just to punish it is it just to debilitate or are we actually trying to help people get to a better place so they don't commit crimes once they come home um, and relating across that experience. So that's really important to me as well. And something I never thought that I would think about until I lived alongside people in prison who had committed crimes. Mm -hmm. Are you proud of who you've become and how this has all unfolded for you in the end? God, I feel like I'm too busy to feel proud. <laughs> but yeah, now that you ask me, I mean, I feel like I'm doing something that matters and I feel really fortunate to be able to do that. Because not all of us, you know, get to pay the bills by, you know, having a podcast, <laughs> you know. So um, I feel fortunate. I, I mean, I'm fortunate to be alive today. So anything else after that is a bonus. Yeah, you found your rhythm yep. in life. My last question is just what do you think the lesson is hmm. in your life? I mean, something I've really tried to push to people is that the inclination to judge and to condemn is really strong and it's something that we really need to push back against in ourselves. And for me, when I'm encountering people, even who I disagree with vehemently, I'm trying to understand where they're coming from. I'm trying to have compassion for how they arrived at either their belief or the, their behavior. And then I'm trying to think about before I ask someone else to change, how can I change myself so that I open up the opportunity for a better way to be altogether? I try to take some personal responsibility alongside asking other people to hold themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It's yeah. a pleasure. Thank you so much, Amanda. We appreciate it. Thank you.